studying in university in my, in my engineering degree many years ago, I think I may have mentioned this to you. I had a good friend who was, uh, you know, uh, this guy though was rarely in classes. He rarely went to his classes, you know, and, and, and I was the opposite. When I was in university, especially first year, but all throughout my university career, I, I, I went to every single class. I took copious notes. I never skipped a lecture. I was always on time. I always took good notes. You know, my penmanship was impeccable. I made little diagrams in my notes. I, I used multicolored pens, you know, rulers underlined. And inevitably, at the end of each term, my friend who was in the same program as myself would ask me for my notes. And then he'd photocopy them. And then he'd use them to study for, for his exams. I end up, you know, my university days with like high Bs, B, you know, B pluses, et cetera. But my friend, who never went to classes, ended up getting top marks in school. He ended up, you know, going to get his PhD in the US, and now actually he's a lecturer, he's a professor at York University right now, right? And it turns out, what I, I didn't find out until later was he was using the time that he saved going to class and taking notes that I was doing for him. He used that time to study, ex to do more studying. You know, he would, he would, go, uh, he would uh, do more labs as well. He would do more, more studying of other textbooks from outside the class, uh, problem sets and everything. And that's how he did so well. So what's the lesson here? Okay. Well, you know, I, I thought I should have charged him for my notes. <laughs> I really should have charged him all those years. And the lesson is not that you should skip class, okay? You youngins, don't, don't skip class. The lesson is this. When at a certain level in schooling, it doesn't matter how good you look as a student, how good your notes are. It doesn't matter how, 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 how you, you know, uh, play the role of a student well. The key is whether you really know your stuff when it comes to exam time. Do you know the stuff? Do you know how to do the problem sets? Do you know how to, you know, the, the questions? That's the key. You can't fake it at a certain point when you get to university. It's got to be on the inside. It's got to be on the inside. And in life, there are some things you can fake on the outside, but there are also other things which you have to know on the inside. It has to be true. And that is what matters of faith and religion are. It has to be from the inside out. The title of my message this morning. When it comes to your faith, it's got to be there, and you can't fake it. Jesus said this, and my, my old Sunday school teacher used to call this the most, the scariest verses in the Bible. So, in a sense, I'm going to give you the tough verses right off the bat this morning. Matthew 7, verses 21 and 23, Jesus is, is said this, Not everyone who says to me, to Jesus, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Apart, away from me, you evildoers. People, Jesus said, will be right there at the gate of heaven, the pearly gates, fully expecting to get in. And there won't be a few of these people, there'll be many of these people, and they'll be sorely disappointed for all of eternity. They're expecting eternal life, they'll end up with eternal death. These are religious people, not just ordinary people, they're religious people. Because they think they're Christians, they will call Jesus Lord. They will say things and do things in his name, the text says, three times it says, in my name, in my name, or in, in your name. They will prophesy, in other words, preach, maybe to thousands, maybe to small groups, maybe to Sunday school classes, maybe to VBC. They will drive out demons, maybe literally, maybe figuratively, they will be used in counseling to help out, get rid of demons of despair and demons of discouragement or something like that. Like that. They will help marriages, they'll help people with addictions. They will, they will encourage people. They will even perform miracles at church, at work, at school. But then Jesus says, he will tell these people, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's scary, isn't it? That's scary. How can we prevent this from happening to ourselves? How can we avoid being a fake? 
How do we know we are a fake? You know, on the, on the, on the internet, you have a lot of self-evaluation questions, uh, uh, surveys. You know, how do you tell whether you're a narcissist? How do you tell whether you have cancer? How do you tell whether you're a good parent? How do you tell, you know, what your love language is or whatever? This morning, I want to give you six basic tests to see whether you're a fake. Now, I want to remind you, these tests are for yourself, not to ask God for the person next to you, or your spouse, or your kid, or your parent, or your teacher, or whatever, or your pastor. So it's not for you to check other people, it's for you to check yourself this morning. Don't judge. In our, earlier in our, uh, from Matthew 7, the, the verses just before Jesus talks about, uh, you know, uh, saying, people depart from me, he says this, verse 1 to 5, Do not judge, or you will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, you'll be, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes brother's eye. So in so many ways, this morning's message may be the most important message you will ever hear. I'm not saying the best message. I'm not the best preacher. There are people much more uh, skilled at preaching this morning. But what I want to share with you this morning is, you know, it brought me honestly, this has made me lose a lot of sleep this week. This will probably be the most important message you ever hear in your life. If you get this one wrong, there's no second chances at the gates of heaven. Some of us may be thinking we're Christians, but we're not. How do you know you're fake? Today we're going to go through a section in the book of Luke. Uh, where, where we are returning to our series on, on the Disciples' Manual. Three weeks ago, Jesus accused of being in league with the devil, Beelzebub. We learned that he, that he wasn't. It was an attack on his authority. And then he, and then he, and then he answers back the necessity of the, of the word of God. Pastor Kwan pre, um, preached a few weeks ago. And then he talked about last week the, the necessity of the, spiritual, of the Spirit's illumination in your heart. This week we will continue on looking at the inside, the heart. In some senses, it's going to be the easiest message I ever preached. Because this message this morning, as I mentioned, not always important. It's the one message that is right throughout the whole Bible. It separates true religion from false religion. In another sense, this is the hardest mes message for me to preach. Because I have to examine myself. I have to realize, am I one of these Pharisees? Am I one of these guys that think he's a Christian and he, he isn't? And be honest, as I was going through this, preparing for this week's message, all my sins started coming up again and again. You know, I started to remember all the sins I've done. Because we all know, we, but you know, part of it, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the scriptures and studying it, and I'm, I'm examining myself, and also I realize it's a very simple message because we all hate hypocrites, don't we? We all hate fakes. We all hate, that's why a lot of people don't, I just heard it last week, someone said the reason they don't go to church is because there's so many hypocrites in the church. But before, by the way, before we um, continue on, I want to mention that I realize there's more than just hypocrites in the church, okay? But our text this morning talks about religion, religious people, the church. So I'm going to focus on the church. I realize hypocrites are everywhere. And, and the people who say that, you know, I don't, I don't go to church because of the hypocrites, I usually say, you know, well, come join us. You know, if you're one, you come join us. And I, and I also use the illustration, um, you know, they say, oh, all churches are full of hypocrites. I say, you know, it's like counterfeit money. The only reason there are count, there's counterfeit money is because there's real stuff somewhere, and that real stuff is valuable and worth it. So if you don't, if you don't think there's, there's any genuine people at our church, keep on looking, okay, because <laughs> there's some real stuff somewhere. Okay? But... How do we uh, know that if we're a fake or not? Let's go into our text. Luke chapter 11, verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. So Jesus had finished talking about all these things from the, we've been studying the last few weeks, and then a Pharisee meets up with him, invites him in. Who's a Pharisee? The name for the, the Pharisees, was, they took their name from the Hebrew word for to be separated. They separated themselves from the world and from evil pagan practices and forces. They were the party of the synagogue. 
They were a, a legalistic separatist group who strictly kept the law of Moses and the unwritten tradition of the elders called the Mishnah. Okay? They were self-appointed guardians of the law. Although they, were, although they were relatively few in number, about 6,000 during the time of Jesus, they enjoyed the support of the people and they influenced popular opinion. They were the only party to survive the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And they are now the spiritual forefathers of modern Judaism. They even exist today. I want to preference my later remarks about them with the fact that they were not all that bad. Okay? We need to understand that. The Pharisees were actually very, many of them were very sincere. And they, are, they, were, the, they were the, if you look at theology, they were the closest to us evangelicals of that day. They were the closest group to us. We would be considered closest to the Pharisees if we were to go back in the first century. And even people like the Apostle Paul, many years later, was proud of his Pharisaic heritage. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Okay, they didn't have a monopoly on hypocrisy. Then, unfortunately, even though they look good on the outside, Jesus exposes their sin on the inside. And the, and the, big, the big idea, if you want to just encapsulate it for today's message, and it's kind of in your first title in, in, the, in your notes in the, in the bulletin, is externalism. Jesus is saying in this morning's message that the true religion and faith that God honors is a religion from the inside, not a religion from the outside. And when you focus on the outside, you tend to miss out on the inside. Okay, that's, a, that's the basic idea. Religion of the inside out. Let's look at our text again. Verse 38, the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Okay, he doesn't say he said anything, but Jesus recognizes there's some kind of disdain in his, in his attitude. Okay. Why was he su surprised? Because he didn't wash before the meal. Baptizo is, is the name in, 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 uh, in, in the original Greek language. He didn't wash before the meal. What do you mean by washing before the meal? He didn't wash his hands before the meal. Uh, you know, now, we want to recognize that that washing of the hands was not, had anything to do with, with hygiene. It wasn't, they didn't know anything about germs in those days, okay? Just keep that in mind. There's nothing to do with hygiene. It was purely ritual, purely rule. In those days, the Pharisees followed the, 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 the sayings of the elders, and they said that you had a certain way, and anyone who was godly, anyone who was religious, had to wash their hands before they ate in a certain way. Okay, and that the quantity of water and the manner of washing was prescribed in minute detail in their laws, the Mishnah. Okay? So, uh, someone had to pour water on your, on, your, on your hands, from a jug on your hands. The fingers must be pointing up. Okay? As long as the water dripped, enough water dripped off your wrist, then you can proceed to the next step, which then to, to put your fingers pointing downwards, and then let the water drip off your hands. And then you had to use the fist of one hand to wash, and then the fist of the other hand to wash the other side. That was washing. And Jesus didn't do that, and so this Pharisee is surprised. Okay. Over the years, these Pharisees who started off sincere started to make all these rules and regulations. And, and, and just, it's just like um, uh, if, we, you know, if we were to, uh, uh, you, don't, you go into a house and you don't take off your shoes, okay? Can you imagine going to a, into your a neighbor's house or something and you just came out from the outdoors and you just you keep your shoes on on the carpet, right? That's how shocking it is, okay, for these, these Pharisees. It's not recorded that he said anything, but Jesus recognizes it. And then here's what Jesus responds, verse 39 and 41. Then you Pharisees, he says, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? Verse 40, but give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. The result of all this focus on the outside Jesus is mentioning is that they're so worried about looking good on the outside that they left the inside dirty in their lives. And it's, they're full of greed and wickedness. Greed. People thought they were so holy that their, own, their, their, their whole lives was to give to God and give to others. But Jesus said, no, no. Why you're in it, to, you're in it, this whole religious thing, you're in it for the money. I was listening to the radio this morning, WDCX, Christian radio station, and um, Ravi Zacharias was speaking. And he mentions how there was this liberal seminary he went to one time. And in this liberal seminary, the professor is asking um, the, all the students, how many of you believe in God, and these are people getting ready to go into ministry, you know, like Curtis and all that, right? And he said only a few people put their hands up. The majority of them didn't believe in God, didn't believe God existed. 
shocked Ravi, and later on he asked the, the, one of the students who didn't put their hand up, why are you in the ministry at all? Why are you, why are you in seminary, seminary at all? And the guy answers this. He said, um, even though I don't believe in God, uh, there's big bucks in the God racket. <laughs> he said, there's big bucks in the God racket. He was in it for the money. You know, he probably wasn't Baptist, okay? <laughs> he probably wasn't, but anyways, we're not liberal, right? But the, the, the fact is, he was in it for the money. He was in it for the money. These are the pastors who don't feed the sheep, they beat the sheep or fleece the sheep. And then there's wickedness. There's, even though they look good on the outside, inside they want to hurt people. There's wickedness, there's sin. Why did the Pharisees focus on the externals? Doesn't everyone know it's supposed to be internal? Religion's supposed to be internal? You know, the fact is that you can always manage your external, but you can't manage the internal. That was their problem. They, 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 they realized they can fix, they can dress nicely on the outside, but on the inside, there was this whole world of corruption and greed. And that's just too scary or too, I shouldn't say scary, too hard to deal with. And the religion was just on the outside. They were about doing. Jesus says, yes, do, but also you have to be. Ministries and living the Christian life is all about character and integrity on the inside, not on the outside. So he says, give what's inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. The precise meaning of this text is a little bit difficult to understand, but the best, I, I think the best understanding is he's saying this, give from inside to the poor, and don't just give from the outside. So when you're offering, give from your heart, not just the money. And then if you do that, everything will be clean for you, Jesus said. I had a friend, a pastor friend, who went to his, his, actually Israel with another friend, and the other friend, when, when, when children were begging on the streets, would, would, give, them, would give money. And, but the friend, my pastor friend, was noticing how this other guy was getting a kick out of giving money, and he was laughing, because he would hold this, a bill up or something, and then and out of nowhere, all these kids would start flocking to him like pigeons to popcorn. And he, and, if, and, and he was just laughing, you know, and, and, in, and he purposely he sees a bunch of kids far in the distance, he sees how long it takes for them to run for the money. And my friend just got disgusted because he was giving to get back from, from these people, to get this feeling of I'm a rich person and you're, you know. Give from the inside, Jesus said. You Pharisees gave from the outside. So is your religion all about the outside? Do you give for what you can get? Do you give unconditionally? Can you give secretly so that no one else knows? Dish clean on the inside first. Then Jesus gives six woes. I call them the woes, W-O-E-S, okay? Six woes. He says, these are, he says you Pharisees and, and teachers of the law, here are six, and I call them the six marks of eternal, of, of not eternal, an external faith. And then Jesus hones in on them. He says, watch out for these six things. He says, whoa, by the way, I don't think he's screaming. I don't think he's yelling. I don't think he's, you know, looking down from bifocals or whatever, just trying to, no, I think he's saying, oh, alas, some some commentary uses the word alas, or this is too bad, or man, I can't believe this, you guys feel this way, and he's he's giving them a a, a grieving look, and he's saying, you Pharisees, be careful of these six external marks of faith. First external mark, legalism. Woe to you Pharisees, verse 42, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of her- garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter, the justice and the love of God, without leaving the former, the tithing, undone. Here, as Jesus grieves over the Pharisees' practices, he says, you are, you are, your tithing is just exter- external. A tithe means you give a tenth of what you, what you earn. And in the law, Deuteronomy and, and, and Leviticus, it says you're supposed to give a tenth of your crops. It's supposed to be a joyful offering in love. But the, but the calculation of the one-tenth of even the little stalks in their garden made the Pharisees into, made this law into a burden, a burden and a mockery of God's law. The law actually said, you just give a tenth of your crops. It actually literally said, don't give, you don't have to give a tenth of the rue and the, and the mint, okay? 
But, the, but what the Pharisees would do is say, oh, if we have to give a tenth of our crops, maybe then that, that, that should mean we have to give a tenth. We have to go to our garden, count off ten little mints on the, in the backyard, and give one of them, the equivalent of one of them to the church or to the synagogue, right? Okay? And they were being so picky. And they were so worried. And so, so you got to look in your garden and look at every single stalk. Or num- you number off and you count one-tenth. And you give the equivalent to the synagogue. And Jesus is saying, you are so worried about the details, you're forgetting the main thing, which is mercy and love of God, right? You're so worried about those details. You know, you're, the old saying is, our, our English saying is, you can't see the forest for the trees. You're, you're, you're so focused on the details, you can't see the big picture. I, I think of those old um, magic 3D photos. Remember those magic 3D photos they made by computers? And, you have to, and, and it's very hard to see. But what you have to do is that you can't look at all the little pictures inside that photo. You have to kind of step back, look beyond it, and then you see the, the, the image coming out, right? Look at the big picture. Don't split hairs. Don't worry, so worry about the little things, you forget the big things. What big things? He talks about justice and love of God. Since he's talking about the outward things here in this text of the, of the Pharisees, I believe the justice and the, outward of, and the love of God means the outward justice, outward love of God. So the, the Pharisees were saying things like, you know, God's justice demands that I care more about him, therefore I'm not going to care about you people. I'm so worried about caring about God's justice, about being right. I'm not going to be right by you. The love of God. I'm, I'm so busy praising and loving God, I have no time to love you and to help you out. That was the Pharisees. Are you more concerned about being right than you are about being Christ-like? Are you more concerned about being right than you are than being Christ-like? I'm not saying it's, wrong to be, it's good to be wrong, okay? Theologically wrong. We always look at theology. But sometimes we can so focus on the details, we forget the main picture. I was reading a book by Francis and Lisa Chan. Okay? Great, great book, You and Me Forever, a book on marriage. But he had this title on learning to fight well. And I want to read this to you because I thought this was ex- excellent. He says that sometimes we religious people can be more concerned of being right than being like Christ. It's easy to get blinded in the heat of disagreements. Soon all we want is, our, is to win, even if victory requires sin. But unfortunately, the one who wins the argument is often the one who acts less like Christ. Okay, he's referring mainly to humility, but, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, but I, I think it applies here too. Every marriage goes through moments of anger and temporary failures, but you must determine your goal. What matters most, winning an argument or resembling Christ? Even in the heat of an argument, we should be asking ourselves that we are acting like Jesus. I'll admit it, I love winning. When I lose in sports, I lose sleep. I stay up thinking about what I could have done differently. I hate losing. When I lose an argument, I think of things I should have said. It's a great feeling to say something that silences your opponent. One of the first arguments Lisa and I had about miniature golf was about miniature golf. We were talking on the phone and trying to figure out what to do on Friday night. We were going out with two other couples and she suggested that we play miniature golf. I told her that that wouldn't be the best because they will not let six people play together. We'd have to split into two groups. To which she answered, well, that's so stupid. Are you sure? That doesn't make any sense. A wise man would have just left it alone. But I went on to explain why it made more sense that a group of six would move more slowly than two groups of three. She made it clear that she didn't understand what I was saying and that I was wrong. Once again, a wise man would have left it alone. A humble man wouldn't care about winning. I chose the foolish, arrogant route. I proceeded to send a fax over to her workplace, diagramming the pace of a group of six versus the pace of, a, of two groups of three. I was immature. I made matters worse, but I won the argument. Through the years, we've had arguments over Monopoly, Scrabble, Taboo, Settlers of Catan, the size of my brain, Mariah Carey, Santa Claus, you name it. We've also had more serious arguments about how, how to discipline our children, spend our money, and spend our time. We don't fight a ton, but we do fight. We're human, and, we're both, and we both love winning. I'm guessing we're not the only ones. 
The one verse that keeps us grounded in this area is, is the verse from James 4 to 6. 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Are you more worried about winning than you are about being Christ-like? Are you legalistic about things like that? Legalism, first mark, of an outside religion. Second mark, quickly, pride. Related to this, the story you just mentioned, uh, Christ said this, verse 43 of our text, Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. The most important seats in the synagogue. In those days, everyone would be sitting kind of similar to us. Uh, we would have an altar in the front of the, of the synagogue. You'd actually literally have, though, a, a bench in the front facing towards the congregation. And this was meant for the, the, uh, the, the people of dignity who just literally sit there every, every Sabbath day. That's where the people who thought they were the most religious like to sit. They get to sit in the, the seats of, of, of um, uh, the important seats. And they like to, like to be greeted in the, in, in, the, in the marketplaces. The Agora, the marketplace, was a civic center where everyone who wanted to be someone was, was seen. That's where the politicians had their photo ops. That's where people hung out. Uh, that was, that's where the court was. That's where all the people gathered for recreation. And, the, and, and when you greet someone in that culture in those days, the greeting style of greeting was dependent on your status in society. And the more higher you up were in society, the more elaborate the greeting. And so these Pharisees love to have these people come to them and have all these fancy greetings and call them whatever, reverend doctor or whatever, right? And, and they, they, they like that. Jesus says, woe to you, your pride. It's more about outside than inside. Your religion is more about pride than authenticity. What are you more concerned about? Your reputation or Jesus' reputation? Your name or Jesus' name? Your honor or Jesus' honor? Your status, your praise, your degrees, your legacy, your fame, or Jesus's? How can you tell? Try the disciplines of spiritual secrecy, the spiritual disciplines of secrecy. Do good works in secret. Don't let anyone see it. But withdraw away, if you're in the public eye, spend some time away quietly with the Lord. Just you and him. Do things in secret. Don't do it for pride. Legalism, pride, hidden corruption. Number three, verse 44. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing it. To walk on a grave was to get ceremonially unclean. That's why they whitewashed the graves, so people would not touch them by mistake. But some people uh, didn't have the means to whitewash their graves, and literally people sometimes would walk over these graves, and they become ceremonially unclean. And Jesus is saying, you Pharisees, your doctrine is just like that, and people unknowingly walk over you and touch your doctrine and get to know, and they end up being unclean. But you know, you look good on the outside like a grave, but inside, like a grave, there's deadness, there's corruption, there's putridness, there's sin, there's hidden corruption. You look good on the outside, on the inside, there's hidden corruption. This commentator said this, Modern psychology has given us new insights into the complicated relationship between the outside and the inside. We know, for example, that an exterior of a certain kind of person often means an interior of exactly the opposite sort. Then, uh, sorry, that quite, and that quite without a person knowing it, he may clean the, clean the outside of his cup in order to hide from himself the fact that inside it's unclean. Just as an aggressive exterior may conceal terrible anxiety and insecurity, in other words, someone who's really macho and whatever you call that on the outside, really big on the outside, really inside is very insecure sometimes. He's doing the opposite. Just as an overly humble appearance may hide insufferable pride. Someone that looks like a little meek mouse on the outside really might be very proud on the inside. And then the interpreter says, uh, the commentator said, instances of this type could be multiplied indefinitely. In other words, an extra holy outside, over the top righteousness, can be hiding an extra evil interior. You know, you fake it by going the complete opposite direction. I, I remember one, one pastor told me that when he has a weak point in the sermon, in his notes he puts down, yell more <laughs> at this point. Okay, it's, it's, so people are more focused on his yelling than, than, on, than on the actual point. 
Shakespeare said this in Hamlet. He said, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. Okay, and the idea is that the person's overly frequent or vehement attempts to protest something or oppose something can indicate that the person is really dealing with that same issue in their own life. And to be very honest, you know, I realize the older I get, the older people get in general, the more you lose, there is to lose if, if people start seeing your sins. The higher you get in a church or whatever, in society, the higher you get, the more there is to lose in your title, position, salary, whatever. And so the more reason, more temptation to hide your sins. That's why you get in these big mega churches. You think they're really holy pastors or whatever, and all of a sudden you realize they've been hanging out with whatever, prostitutes, right? The three big ones, money, sex, and power. They're whitewashed tombs. Jesus says, woe to you, Pharisees. You look good on the outside, but inside there's hidden corruption. There's deadness. These pastors or these missionaries didn't start out that way. But after a while, they didn't deal with their inner life, the shadow lands. And that inner life got completely opposite to what they're projecting on the outside. Scary stuff, isn't it? Legalism, pride, hidden corruption, burdening others. Verses 45 and 46. The experts in the law answers this. You know, the experts in the law are basically like the Pharisees. They're very similar. They're more legal. The Pharisees are more religious. Okay? Teacher, you say these things, you insult us. And then Jesus says, oh, you know, wait, wait, you're, you're off the hook too. Verse 46. You experts in the law, you, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Okay? You lawyers, what were the burdens that they can hardly carry? It was the scribal con- con- uh, laws. But all the laws that these, these lawyers, they're not modern-day lawyers, by the way, okay? So if you're a lawyer this morning, my apologies. Uh, I'm going to use the same term, lawyer, but completely different. They're actually more like seminary professors. And those lawyers in those days made all these laws on top of the biblical laws. And they actually put them above biblical laws because they said this. They would say this. The, you, if you sin against the biblical laws, um, it's understandable because it's so complicated. But our Mishnah and our commentaries have made the laws clear, the biblical laws clear. Therefore, if you sin against our laws, it's a, it's a worse sin because you're sinning against clear teaching. Okay? They actually elevated above the biblical laws. Okay? And they were not willing to help. They would throw all these extra laws out there and they wouldn't lift a finger. Mark 7, Jesus talks about the, you know, and, they, and not even they did not lift a finger, they would use those extra quick, those extra laws to skirt the law. Because if you had knowledge, there are ways to skirt the law. And so you don't have to do it yourself, but other people don't realize that, and they have to do it, okay? For example, Mark, Mark 7, verse 9 to 13. Jesus continued, you Pharisees, teachers of the law, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, meaning devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. The law says take care of them, including uh, financially, and you say, oh, but my money is devoted to God, therefore you don't help. That's your, your law, you don't help them out. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. For example, the scribes taught concerning the Sabbath. So they said to everyone, oh, okay, no work on the Sabbath. Here's what it means, they said. On Saturday, the Jewish day of the week, uh, the holy day of the week, a man must not carry a burden in his right hand or in his left hand or in his bosom, his chest, or on his shoulders. But here's what they also said. But you can carry a burden on the back of your hand, Okay or with your foot, or with your mouth, or with his elbow, or in his ear. I have no idea how you carry a burden on your ear, but, or in his hair, or in his wallet, as long as the wallet is carried with the mouth downwards, or between his wallet and his shirt, or in the hem of his shirt, or in his shoe, or in his sandals. That is the extra burdens that they, they put on. Can you imagine, you know, the, the, um, they multiplied all the laws this way, and it became a burden, and so people were spending all the time trying to figure out what exactly was the law, and they couldn't do other things in life. They're not, they couldn't 
do the justice and mercy in life. The modern descendants of those lawyers and the Pharisees are a modern Orthodox Judaism, where you can't do work on a Sabbath by pushing a button. Hence, you go to Mount Sinai, you go to other uh, Jewish hospitals, and what, what do you have? The Sabbath day elevators, right? It, it stops on every floor because good Jews don't press a button on the Sabbath. My sister, I remember she told me once on a, on a, on a Saturday, she's walking somewhere, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an Orthodox Jewish rabbi runs towards her on a Saturday morning, and he didn't touch her, of course, he can't shake hands with a, a woman, but then he quickly asked her, can you please help our synagogue? What, what's wrong? Uh, we, we forgot to turn the lights on yesterday. And so we need someone to go with, and so she had to go to her synagogue to turn the lights on, because that's doing work. That's doing work. Can you imagine that? You know, the, 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 um, the, all those rules and regulations, so busy doing religious things, you don't have time to help the poor, the needy. So, so busy with church and all the rules and regulations, you don't have time to serve in a soup kitchen or whatever. Knowledge to them became holiness. Ignorance became sin. It's all about our religion. Are you tougher on others than you are on yourself? Do you consider it your job to make other people feel guilty all the time? Legalism, pride, hidden corruption, burdening others. Fifthly, rejecting God's word. Woe to you because you build tombs to the prophets and it was your forefathers who killed them. So, verse 48, so you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Who are the prophets? The prophets were those that gave the word of God. Jesus saying that, you know, woe to you. You think you honor the prophets by building their tombs, but really, inside you, your spirit is exactly the same as those guys that killed the prophets because they hated the word of, the word of God. And you, you hate the word of God. You think you love the word of God, but you rebel against it. Jesus is giving the word of God, and they hated him. Woe to you because the way you treat the word of God. Woe to you. Verse 49 and 51, right? Uh, he says, I will send... That's why God has said, I will send them prophets and apostles. Some of them they will kill and others they will persecute. We don't know which book this comes from, but the, it's basically saying, you know, this, he's just saying, uh, woe to you that this is what God's plan was. Even though it was God's plan, yet you killed them. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel, the son of the first people, Adam and Eve, killed by, the, by his brother Cain for his righteousness, to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Zechariah the prophet, killed in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, the last death of a prophet. If you read the Bible in the, in the Hebrew order of, of, of books, he's the last prophet killed. Jesus says, the blood, the responsibility of Abel to Zechariah is on this generation. The blood is on their heads. And we know that that generation was a generation that saw the destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70. Now, the, here's the question. You know, I, I'm thinking, I read it, whoa, what does it mean? How can they be responsible for all those deaths when they weren't even alive when those people were killed? Jesus said, he's basically saying this, you may not have physically killed them, but your spirit is with those that killed those prophets. Recently, there was a uh, man, uh, NFL, former NFL uh, player Aaron Hernandez. I don't know if you heard of what happened. He was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was charged with the killing of Odin Lloyd in June 2013. There was no gun. There was no eyewitnesses that would testify. There was no clear motive. They don't know whether he literally pulled the trigger. But the judge, Susan Garish, when she addressed the jury, pointed out that you can still be convicted of murder under Massachusetts joint venture law. The Commonwealth does not require proof that the defendant himself performed an act that caused Odin Lloyd's death to establish that the defendant is guilty of murder. The Commonwealth requires two things. First, the defendant knowingly participated in the commission of this crime, and second, he did so with the intent required to commit the crime. We may not overtly say, I am an enemy of Jesus Christ. I hate Christians. I hate the word of God. But by our lives, do we assent to those that hate the word of God? What's your attitude towards God's word? Are you, just, are you bored with it? Do you reject it? Or do you love it? Do you hate God's word when, it, when it's, it's shared with you on a sermon or in your devotions? Do you reject the prophet's and the apostles. 
That's what these Pharisees did. Pride, legalism, hidden corruption, burdening others, rejecting God's word, and finally they took away knowledge. Verse 52, Woe to you, the experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. Everyone says these scribes of the law, and, and the Pharisees too, these lawyers, they have the key to knowledge, they all thought. Because they looked so holy, and they brought their big Bibles with them. And, or, well, you know what I'm saying, right? They looked like they had their King James Version. I, no, I, I should not slag the King James. I grew up with the King James. But they spoke in, in their holy language with the these and thous. Our equivalent would be these and thous and the behooves and all that stuff. And everyone, and, they, and everyone goes to them for the key of knowledge to get into heaven. And, but when they turn the key, everyone thinks they're turning clockwise to open the door into heaven and to knowledge. But literally, Jesus, not literally, but figuratively, Jesus is saying they're actually turning counterclockwise. And they're locking the door. And they're keeping people from true knowledge. By their actions, people say, oh, that's the way you live. That's what you're supposed to do as a religious person. They're locking the door and not letting people get in to heaven. That was the Pharisees and the lawyers. That was the, the, the result. You know, I think of, and, and again, I'm, I'm challenged, and I thought about this this week. Us evangelicals, we claim to be the most knowledgeable in religion and faith, and we know how to hermen, you know, how, hermeneutics and how to interpret scriptures. But do our actions belie our knowledge? Do we say that we know the word of God, but our our image is completely different. When people think of the evangelical, what do they think of? Do they think of someone who loves God and loves Jesus Christ, a person of forgiveness and mercy? Or do they think of a guy who, is, who opposes abortion and opposes homosexuality, opposes drinking, smoking, and dancing, and anyone else that dates people that do? Is that the image that the world has of us when they think of evangelicals? What do people think of us? What is the image we're rejecting? We think we're encouraging people to go to heaven. And people in the world are saying, these guys, I don't want to be an evangelical. I don't want to be a Baptist. Look at those guys. They're not even happy at all. Their God doesn't make them happy. Their God gives them no peace. Their God gives them no joy in life. All their God does is oppose everything else, but he's not for anything. Legalism, pride, hidden corruption, burdening others, rejecting God's word, taking away knowledge. How would you respond to Jesus' word, word, word today? The Pharisees and lawyers didn't respond well. Verse 53 and 54, when they heard, when Jesus left, the Pharisees and teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. The word in, in the Greek for catch him is like catching a wild animal. He, he's, he tries to share with them his grief and saying, you know, stay, watch out. These things you're doing is wrong. And instead, they attack the messenger. And all they want to do is catch him in a mistake. How would you respond this morning? For some of you, you will respond in anger and terror. Because you're saying, I came here this morning, Reverend Ted, in your heart, say, I came here because I was really tired but also, I, you know, I, I just, I need to be affirmed. But all you've done, Reverend Ted, is through the scriptures, you made me feel guilty. And, you know, you can, I know you, you you're, you're all six things. And you're angry. You know, don't you understand what I've done for the church? How much I've done? I'm a deacon. Look how many short-term missions I've gone on. Look at the title the church has given me. I've got the certificate of memorization for the Bible when I was a kid in Sunday school. Look at how many people have talked to about Jesus Christ. Look at how loudly I defend purity and righteousness and holiness. You know, I've read the Bible so many times. I read it every day. I've memorized lots, lots of chunks. I've even, I'm getting a degree in seminary and I've got my doctor in ministry. Or I spent hours preparing for sermons. I'm talking, well, of course, you know, I'm speaking to myself here. How many, look how much money I've given to the church or to the poor. Look how big our small group is, how well it's doing. Or the fellowship and how many books I've read, I've read or written. Or the people that told me after service as they shake my hands, 
how good a pastor I am or how many prayer meetings I've gone to. And you're telling me I'm not a Christian? I don't know. If the shoe fits, wear it. But I'm not going to judge you. I'm just saying this is what scriptures say. So some of this morning, this is the most important message you ever heard. Make sure you're right. Make sure you really are in the grace of God. But you know, I, I, I couldn't sleep last night because I was thinking of this message and I thought, is that all I can tell the people this morning? What a downer. <laughs> what a downer. And I thought, okay, there's that one group of people here who, who think they're Christians or aren't. And yeah, that's all you need right now is someone to wake you up. But there's another group of you who, who are genuinely Christians. And for you, you, you maybe don't look like a Christian on the outside. But inside, you wish you could be more like Christ. And you have a heart after him. I was reading this, uh, there's this, this, this uh, viral thing this week on the, on the internet, article about teachers, the title, Teacher's Writing Assignment Becomes Inspiring Lessons for All. April 18th, 2015. When, what started as a little more than a lesson plan for, Den, for a Denver third grade teacher, Kyle um, Schwartz, is actually a female, turned out into a movement across the country that's shown. If you ask children what's wrong, they'll often tell you. The movement, it's, it's called hashtag I wish my teacher knew, began in March when Schwartz had a simple lesson for her third grade students at dual uh, elementary. She simply said, tell me something you wish I, the teacher, knew. And I was just kind of desperate to connect with these kids, Schwartz told NBC News. The answers from children in a school district with a high percentage of low-income students struck a chord nationally when Schwartz shared photos of the responses on Twitter using the hashtag, I wish my teacher knew. And they quick, quickly went viral. Here's some of the sweet responses. I wish my teacher knew I love school. Okay, <laughs> yeah, <that was> smart kid, <laughs> smart kid. I wish my teacher knew how to make poetry easier. <laughs> Another one. Some were revealing. I wish my teacher knew that even though sometimes I do not get good grades, that I try. And also that I get stressed. But when I come to your class, teacher, I feel better. Another smart kid. Right? Uh, but many were heartbreaking. I wish my teacher knew I, I don't have pencils at home to do my homework. I wish my teacher knew sometimes my reading log is not signed because my mom is not around a lot. Or the last one, I wish my teacher knew how much I miss my dad because he got deported to Mexico when I was three years old and I haven't seen him in six years. What do you wish other people knew about you and your faith and your inside? I wish my God knew that I'm trying my hardest. I wish God knows that even though I swear when I get mad, I really don't want to swear. That's just the way I was raised up. I wish God knew that I do love my wife, or that I do love my husband, but I'm, I'm get, I get so tired in life, sometimes I just treat them wrong or my, or my kids. I wish that God knew I wanted to go to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, but I don't know how to d d balance that with having children, three, ki three kids at home. I wish God knew that when I go to work, even though I, I'm, a, I'm a real crab at work, it's just because I don't know how to do it better. I wish God knew I want to read the Bible more, but it just it seems boring to me. And I don't understand all these fancy words. I wish God knew that I, I want to serve, I want to give more money to the church, I want to give more money to, to the charities, but I got to deal with my mortgage. I wish God knew I want to spend more time with my aunt or my uncle or my, my grandpa or my grandma, but I've got all these other things in, in life, I've got, and I've got to take care of my kids and my job. I wish God knew that even though I can't, I can't speak out loud, I really do want to tell people about Jesus Christ. I wish, you know what, I'm here this morning to tell you, God does know. God does know. 1 Samuel 16, 7b, the Lord doesn't look on the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So not only is it terrifying to know God knows your heart, it's the most comforting thing to know that God knows your heart. It's not about how fancy your words are. It's about your heart. 
He knows. He knows your ignorance. He knows you don't know all the ins and outs of Christianity and about the Trinity and about inspiration and all that stuff. He knows your motives. He sees from the inside out. And he's not angry with you. I want to leave you with that word this morning. I, I, I couldn't sleep until about 3 a.m., 4 a.m. this morning until, you know what, the last thought in my mind before I finally conked out was this. Because I was thinking, I can't preach what I was going to plan to preach. I, how can I end that way? The words I want to end with is this. God loves you. He knows you. He loves you. Let's pray. God, 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 we, we, we don't want to make a mistake on this one. Lord, we realize nothing, it's our faith, it, it won't matter when we face you one day, how many people we brought to Christ, how many, how much money we gave to the church, how well we sang in the choir or in the, or in the worship team, how often we went to church, how often we went to prayer meeting, how often we read the Bible. We want to do all those things, Lord. We want to give more. We want to serve more. We want to love more. We want to be more genuine. But you see the heart. And Lord, we want to be a Christian in our heart. We want to love you from the inside out. Lord, I realize this morning I'm not responsible for what your people do, what these, pe- these 200 plus people do. But I'm responsible to tell them the truth. But you love them, and you want them from the inside out. The outside will come. The inside's first. We don't want to be a Pharisee. We don't want to be a, a, a lawyer who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, help us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.